Well, good morning, Meta. Uh, it's a pleasure once again to be uh, worshiping you, even if, again, it's virtually rather than in person. And we are today continuing a part, our, our summer series on the attributes of God. And what is God like? Who is God and what is he like? And today we're going to talk about uh, the unchangeable God. God is unchangeable is the title of the sermon. It's the immutability, simplicity, and impassibility of God. And I'll explain what those uh, words mean, so don't be too upset or worried about that. But I want to uh, begin just with uh, one thing about this series We are doing a more theological series than we often do. Usually we just take one passage of scripture or one book of the Bible and try to work through it, or we take a topic that has to do with much more with practical day-to-day living, such as parenthood or marriage or work and vocation or something of that nature. This series is not like that. Uh, We're dealing with uh, some ideas about who God is and what he is like. And at times, that is going to require uh, us to do a little bit harder thinking. And today's topic uh, with these, uh, with God is unchangeable, uh, requires perhaps even a little bit more than normal. And so I've tried very hard to make this as uh, easy to understand as possible, but there's only, it can only be made so easy. And so I just want to encourage all of you, even if you're an elementary student or uh, one of our our youth, to uh, really today just take some time to think with me. Uh, you know, John, Pastor John Piper likes to say that uh, raking is easy, but all you get is leaves. But when you dig, digging is difficult, but you might find diamonds. And today, we're going to have to put the rake away, get on our, uh, our, our, our boots and our gloves and take a pretty hefty shovel and do some digging today. But I am confident that we will find diamonds at the end of our search. Okay. So open up your Bibles if you have them. Uh, otherwise, the passage will be there on the screen to Acts 14. Acts 14. And I'm going to start at verse 8. Now at Lystra... There was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices saying in Lycaonian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, saying, are crying out, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with good, with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice for them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. The flower fades and the grass withers, but the word of our God endures forever. Well, quite a, an interesting story here. One moment, Paul is about to be sac- Paul and Barnabas are going to be sacrificed to uh, as gods. Uh, the next moment. They're about to be stoned to death. I wonder what you would rather choose. 
Would you rather be uh, treated as a god or would you rather be uh, stoned to death and dragged outside the city and left for dead? Well, Paul's choice and Barnabas' choice was they would rather be dead. They would rather be stoned and killed than treated as gods. Now, if my sermon were specifically on Acts 14 through, uh, tw- 8, 14 through 20, that would be the main point of my sermon. But I want to go a little bit in a different direction here and ask one question, which is, what is the difference between being a God and being a man? What is it that Paul recognizes about himself that leads him to say, no, I am not a God and you are not to sacrifice to me. What fundamentally, fundamentally differentiates God from man? And we have our clue in verse 15. Men, why are you doing these things? Why are you offering sacrifices to us? We also are men of like nature with you. We also are of men of like nature of you. And if you look in the original language, that word nature is actually better translated passions. We are men of like passions as you. We're not gods. We're not God. We have passions just like you have passions. Well, what does he mean by we have passions? Is God not passionate? Does God not have emotions or strong feelings? Well, no, that's not what, not what Paul means. I mean, the Bible uh, tells us again and again that our God has a very rich emotional life. In fact, far richer than our own. But what Paul means uh, can be illustrated in what this crowd does here. As I said, one minute, They're trying to kill him, or they're trying to, they're worshiping him as a god. The next minute, they're persuaded to try to kill him, to stone him to death. This is what is meant by being passionate creatures. This is what Paul is saying I'm like, you're like, we are all like, but God is not like. We are capricious, or to use an easier word, our feelings change from one moment to the next. Our feelings are influenced. We are swayed by events and people. You know, I often uh, get uh, upset at my daughter who can be so excited and happy one moment and then throw a temper tantrum the next. And so I start there thinking, why is she so, such a grumbler? Why does she change so quickly? Why are her emotions so easily swayed? Without realizing at the moment that I was just happy a moment ago because she was happy, and now I'm upset and complaining because she's upset. My emotions are just as easily swayed and changed as hers are. Because we are people. We are creatures. We are not God. And this points to three attributes, three characteristics of God, which can can be summed up by saying God is unchangeable. But I think we need to know uh, a little bit more precisely what that means. So what we're going to say is God is simple. God is impassable. And God is immutable. He is simple. I'll explain what that means in a second because it's probably not what you think. He is impassable, and that's probably not what you think either, and he is immutable. Now, before I explain what those terms mean, I want to just ask a question, a further question, which is, why should we care? Why is it important for us to know that God is simple, impassable, and immutable. What difference does that make in your life 
in your life as a parent, as a spouse, as a child, as a youth, as a grandparent, as an employee or as a student or as a, a housewife or husband, what, or as a retiree, what does, how does this help me trust in God in my circumstances now in my life? How does it help me get through the pandemic? How does it help me uh, think through the various political crises that our nation is enduring right now? Well, turn with me to Psalm 22 because this was of crucial importance to King David at a time of great trial and tribulation in his life. So turn with me to Psalm 22. We don't know exactly the situation David faced uh, at this point. All we know is that it was bad. It was difficult. So much so that Jesus quotes extensively from this psalm when he is on the cross. So the suffering Jesus was going through, the psalm that he most likened it to was this, Psalm 22. So whatever David was experiencing, we know it was bad. Let me read, I'll read the first 11 verses and then I'll skip over to verse 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, In you, our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried and were rescued. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me, they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. And I'm going to skip us down to verse 19. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. I'll stop there at verse 24. What's going on here? There's David's experience. David is in the midst of tremendous suffering at the hands of men. And as he's crying out to God for help, he's hearing nothing. Verse 14 describes him as being poured out like water and his bones are out of joint and his heart is like wax. He is desperate. Those surrounding him are counting his clothes and figuring who's going to get what after we get rid of him. And he's thinking back, thinks back to uh, his fathers. I think he means the Exodus generation and how they were in bondage in Egypt and God brought them out with a mighty hand doing 10 plagues against the Egyptians and then parting the Red Sea and then sustaining them for 40 years in the wilderness. And then all the way through the judges How again and again Israel fell into trouble, cried out to God, God heard and rescued. And then he thinks, you were God when I was in the womb. You took me. 
You made me trust in you. God, you brought me to you. Where are you now? My ancestors trusted in you. And you rescued them. You've made me trust in you. Where is my rescue? Have you changed? Are you different now from the way you were then? Have the rules of the game changed? His suffering calls into question the fundamental goodness, the fundamental stability and consistency of God. And then as a leader, as a king, he has to make a decision. Verse 21, the ESV translation kind of smooths over the text where it says, you have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I don't think that's how it should read. Rescue me from the horns of the wild oxen is a better translation. But in any event, at verse 22, he has to make a decision. Am I going to trust that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Or is he someone our fathers could count on, but we cannot and he makes the decision I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation I will praise you you who fear the Lord praise him and as he makes this decision to trust in God to trust that he is the same God who delivered my ancestors who made me trust in him in my mother's womb he's the same God and he will deliver me today And as he puts his trust in God, praise flows out of his mouth until by the very end, he's announcing that generations after me will tell of your goodness and they will put their hope in you because you are the same God. My ancestors trusted in you when you delivered them. I'm trusting you. You will deliver me and my offspring will trust in you and you will deliver them. Well, I submit that we also need to know whether God is the same today as he was 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago. And so I want to point to three aspects of who God is that can give us confidence that our God does not change. That whatever you are struggling with, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, whatever crisis you are going through, whatever sin you are wrestling with, whatever relational conflict cannot be resolved, whatever debt you are dealing with, you can trust in God to be with you and to fulfill his promises for you to continue to be your God no matter what because he is the same. I want to say three things about God. The first is he is simple. Now, by simple, I do not mean easy to understand. I do not, by simple, mean God is foolish or dumb. I certainly do not mean that. What I mean by simple is, uh, can be illustrated here. What I have here is a little Lego wall, okay? And on this, each color represents uh, a different personality aspect or trait. We as the staff did a little personality inventory while doing some vision work for our church. And uh, mine is blue, green, yellow, red. You don't need to know what all of those are. They're just different uh, things. And in case you're curious, Pastor Edwards is the exact opposite. He's red, yellow, green, blue. Uh, So we work together really well as a team that way. But what you will see is my personality inventory is made up of several pieces. It is built together. Who I am, what I am like, is not simple. It's not one piece. It is a component of many different things. I am complex. You are complex. Everything is complex. This podium is complex, okay? Because what you have here is this little square uh, thing at the top. I don't know what it's called. And then you've got a connecting 
pole with some other stuff. And then down at the bottom, you've got a base. Uh, it's made of various elements that are put together. And beneath that, uh, this is made out of a certain substance. I can't quite figure out what kind of metallic substance it is made of. Let's pretend that it's made out of iron, simply, uh, even though it's probably not, just for the sake of the argument. And this iron okay, is an element that is made of a certain uh, number of protons and electrons and neutrons. And these protons, electrons, and neutrons are made out of uh, even smaller particles. And I think the furthest we've gotten down to are quarks. Right now, that is the indivisible building block of matter. But I'm sure someday we're going to find that quarks are made out of something. And on and on and on we will go. When I was studying physics in high school back in 1987, electrons, protons, and neutrons were indivisible. Okay? Now we know they're not. They're made out of quarks. Everything is made that we see is made out of something. God is not like that. God is not made out of something. Okay? Here's why it's important to see that. My personality inventory. These blocks existed prior to there being a wall. Okay? The individual components logically come before the whole. If God were, say, the sum of his attributes, righteousness, holiness, uh, omnipotence, being all-powerful, omnipresence, being everywhere, if he were the sum of his attributes, then that means those things, holiness, righteousness, uh, power, would come before God. They would be ultimate. God would not be ultimate. And that is a blasphemous thing to say. God is not made up of parts. He's not made up of holiness, righteousness. You stitch it like, like some Frankenstein monster where you stitch all of these attributes together and you get God. In fact, we would not even say that God is composed of Father, Son, and Spirit, as if he's three things connected into, that are made into one. No, God is one. We see this in the, the worship of ancient Israel, the temple. Uh, we find in Leviticus or in Exodus, as they're building things in the temple, certain things that are meant to represent the character of God, we are told in no uncertain terms are to be made of one piece. Okay. The lampstand, which is the Spirit of God upholding the twelve tribes of Israel, one piece. It's not to be made out of different components of metal. There are two altars on which sacrifices are to be made to God. Okay? And the altar that receives them, God, it, these are to be made out of one piece. The breast plate, plate of the high priest, which is God bearing the names of Israel in his heart. One piece. Okay? Because in the most fundamental worship of God, the Israelites were to say, Hear Israel, the Lord your God is one. Not there is one God, although that is also true. God is one. He is a unity. Okay? He cannot be broken into parts. He's not part Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's not part righteousness, holiness, part love, etc. Um, and what this means what this means is that God is not sometimes loving, sometimes wrathful, sometimes just, sometimes merciful. No, all that God is, he always is, 100% of the time to 100% capacity. He is always loving, he is always just, he is always merciful. He is always wrathful. Now, I'll explain a little more about that as we move on. But just to, to grasp this, God is one. He cannot be broken down into pieces. If God is simple, then he is impassable. He is not a creature of like passions as us. God cannot be swayed. Remember the crowds at, at Lystra? 
One minute they want to sacrifice to Barnabas and Paul, the next they want to stone them. They are swayed by passions. This means they have a very unstable emotional state. Just as I can be happy one moment and angry the next, so the crowd was. God is not like that. God is not capricious. He's not angry one moment, happy the next, sad the moment after. He cannot be moved by outside events. He cannot be passioned. He is impassable. Now, does that mean God is unfeeling? Absolutely not. God feels love, joy, grief, anger, and every other emotion infinitely more intensely than we do. His emotional life is infinitely richer than ours. He is always infinitely loving towards his people and always infinitely angry towards sin and ultimate and always infinitely saddened by tragedy. God can do this in a way we cannot because he is God. He is not of like passions as we are. God will appear to us as if he changes. We will experience him as sad when we mourn, as loving when we seek out his mercy, as angry when we rebel against him. But it is not God who has changed. It is us. Just as it appears that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, rises in the east and sets in the west, when actually it's the earth that moves. So also, how we experience God is based on changes in our relationship with him. He is pleased with our obedience and displeased with our disobedience. Just as the sun seems hot in the summer and cool in the winter, our vantage point has changed. God has not. So how we experience God depends on changes in us, not changes in God. Which means, the upshot of this, the the key thing is, God never changes. His character never changes. His love for his people never changes. His unshakable purpose for the good of those who love him never changes. The God who rescued the patriarchs and rescued David and sent his only son to die for our sins and establish his church against which the gates of hell have not prevailed has not changed. Now, this may raise a troubling question. God may not change. Okay, Pastor Andrew, you've convinced me of that. But I am a creature of passions. I change. I am not immutable. How do I know that I will continue to experience God as a loving and gracious father when I change? How do I know that changes in me will not lead to God responding to me as a stern and strict judge? The answer to this as in so many other things, can be seen in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Let me explain what I mean by that. When Jesus came to earth, he lived the perfect life. He followed every single one of God's commandments from the heart. There was never any mistrust of God. There was, en- there was never any loving of the creature over the creator. Jesus, God in the flesh, was the perfect man. The perfect life that we should have lived, he lived for us as our substitute. What we deserved is death. We deserve God turning his face away from us and letting us experience the fullness of his wrath. But Jesus took that on himself 
for us. He lived the perfect life that we should have but couldn't. And he died the death we deserved on our behalf. He did this as our representative and our substitute. Everything that Jesus did is credited to all those who believe in him. When he rose from the dead, was vindicated by God, all those for whom Jesus died are now seen by God through the lens of Jesus Christ. God looks at us as if we had Jesus' righteousness and none of our sin. And Jesus Christ never changes. Hebrews 13, 8 tells us, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. Therefore, God is always well pleased with him as his beloved son. And therefore, if you are in Christ, he is forever pleased with you as his beloved son or daughter. His love for us will never change because God never changes and his son never changes. And therefore, his love for all who are in the son will never change. And his purposes for all who are in the son will never change. This is where David found his strength to know God never changes. And in the Messiah, in our Savior, there is a sense in which we will never change. And therefore, God's purposes for us are unshakable. As he says in Romans 8, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, Christ Jesus. And those whom he predestined, he justified. Those whom he justified, he glorified. God will never leave you or forsake you. You I remember when Angela and I moved from Taiwan to the United States. And all of a sudden, I mean, I'd, I'd been a part of American church culture. It wasn't as huge a shift for me. But for Angela, all of a sudden, just everything was different. And I shared a couple months ago about the financial troubles we were going through. Uh, Our church life was also very difficult. Uh, We were stripped away from the the deep and rich community that we had at our church in Taiwan to where it was just us and a few other adults and we weren't getting along very well. Um, They're they're, they're great and godly people. We were young and immature. Uh, It just didn't work out, okay? But the, the, the main point of the story here is we were not experiencing God the way we had in Taiwan. And I just remember Angela asking, What's, why is it so different? And we had to go before God. And we struggled and wrestled in prayer and in scripture. And God slowly began to reveal to us through his word, he's the same God in Taipei, as he is in the San Francisco Bay Area, as he is in Houston. Our God, the God who rescued you and brought you so much joy when you first put your trust and hope in him and your, your faith life seemed to have so much potential when you were baptized. He's the same God now as he is as you face a difficult marriage, tension between your, you and your parents or you and your children a career that has hit a dead end, a sinful habit that you just can't break. He is still the same God and he will not let go of you. And so, take this doctrine of God's unchangeability, of his simplicity, impassivity, or impassibility and immutability and the cross 
and grab onto this. This doctrine should lead us to two things. It should lead us to hope and it should lead us to worship. Hope in the darkest times knowing that God has not changed and to worship as we see the beauty of the unchangeable God. We see how immutable he is. Our hearts should be filled with awe and wonder knowing that this is the God who brought me to salvation, he will get me through to the end. He has promised, he is faithful to his promises because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm going to close uh, after uh, prayer and benediction. I'm hoping that uh, for the outro, uh, there's a song, uh, a hip hop song that I'm, I'm hoping Bing will be able to play for us. Uh, it is Our God is Immutable by uh, Shai Lin. And just meditate on the lyrics as you close today. But this is who God is. And this is who God is for us. Let me pray. Father, we thank you so much that you are the rock, the set peace that never changes. That in all our instability, in all our wandering and wavering, You never change. And if we are in Christ Jesus, your love for us and your purpose for us will never change. So Father, I pray for all those who are struggling, wondering where you are. How come things seem so different when we can't meet together in person? When there's so much instability in our country? and in our world. I pray they would meditate on this truth and find peace with you. And I pray for all those listening who have not yet come to faith in you. I pray that you would awaken in them a desire to see the beauty of the unchangeable God, to find something in this world that they can count on, ground that will not shift, firm, solid ground. They put their hope and trust in you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here, today's benediction from the book of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Concludes our service for today. God bless you on the Sabbath day. Bye-bye.